Welcome back to the Beyond the Scope podcast. I am your host, senior year medical student, Andy. Uh, so here we continue the mission of sharing impactful stories from students, residents, and attendings of all different medical professions while giving you an inside look into their lives, not just as healthcare workers, but the incredible people they are as well. And this podcast, of course, if you've been following for a while, is all about the things those medical school years don't really teach you things that are beyond the scope of our practice. So with that being said, let's introduce today's guest. And uh, I know I have my set intro. This one is actually going to be kind of about <laughs> the things that medical school teaches you. And in fact, it's going to be more of an episode to listen in the car. And to be honest, could be a precursor to some ideas further down the road as I want to include more educational pearls on my channel. Uh, but the reason why I am growing more confident in including educational points is because of the guy I have on the podcast right here. I'm not going to say my step two score out loud, but let's just say it was pretty damn good. And uh, it was all thanks to the mentorship guidance and study tips from today's guest. Current pediatric critical care physician at the Cleveland Clinic, he has shared his passion for medical education across the social media and specializes in USMLE prep, whether that be step one, shelves, or now kind of the big bulk of preparation, step two CK. His Notion template quite literally directed my life for uh, three months as I pushed through uh, step dedicated and I, I really credit his habits to my success and sanity during that time. Uh, so for all those in medical school and even those pre-meds who want to read and listen along uh, to see what you're about to get into, uh, this is an episode for you. And so we got the guidance of the one and only Dr. Rahul Damania, aka Hi Guru. Welcome back to the channel. Andy, so great to see you. You are past the finish line. I'm, I'm super excited and thanks so much for the kind words. Oh, of course. Again, it's a pleasure to have you back on the channel. Um, again, for those of you watching or listening, uh, you may recognize the voice and the face. Uh, he was the pediatric critical care representative um, on my 73 question series. And you know, it's been a, oh man, it's been a while since uh, we met and you are now moved on from the pick you fellow life to attending. So how's attending life been? You know, sometimes attending life feels uh, like drinking from a fire hose, especially this first year. Uh, but I will say I love where I work. I love uh, my colleagues and all of the uh, amazing, bright people who I can work with each and every day. So uh, I do want to just say, Andy, that uh, this time uh, on your channel, I uh, took the tag off of my shirt. We got a couple uh, <laughs> comments uh, from the 73 question video because I thought it was nice and fancy to buy a new shirt before the video. I forgot, I forgot to take off the tag. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. Well, I think we'll be okay um, today again because uh, we are doing uh, something pretty cool. We, we are going to walk through some USMLE style questions that you have designed based on your experience and um, yeah, extensive tutoring um, with uh, USMLE. Uh, and speaking of USMLE, and by the way, those watching, uh, if you want to just like skip all this and go straight to the questions, there'll probably be a timestamp on the screen like here. So you can skip there. Uh, but you know, we all know, especially my class of 2024, uh, step one is pass fail across the board. Um, and I know a lot of the focus of USM Elite Prep has previously been step one because that's kind of the make or break. Um, but for my class, step two is kind of that first run of this is the only number you got. So how have you shifted your focus and strategies um, now that step two is the main thing? Absolutely. Um, you know, Andy, I, I really am passionate about both step one shelf and uh, step two CK uh, prep. So I uh, think that when it comes to both of these exams, they're under this research category of like high stakes exams. And there truly are high stakes in terms of, you know, 
A, it's stressful to prepare for them, and B, residency program directors take it uh, into account when uh, they, you are applying uh, through your ERAS application. Um, when it comes to step one, I actually prepare the same way as it was uh, when I took it, uh, which was a three-digit score. And I think understanding like the basic fundamentals really allows for you to excel on shelf and step two CK because truly they are complementary to each other. And throughout this episode, and as we kind of break down these uh, questions, hopefully I'll be able to share uh, some of those uh, integrations. Absolutely. And uh, you, you mentioned those fundamentals and of course we'll break those down um, as we go through those questions. Um, and so kind of preview of the format of this episode, we're gonna be going through, I believe five practice questions. Um, that are attuned to each of the shelves. Um, and that was kind of the backbone of how I prepared for step two, um, kind of snaking my way through um, like OBGYN, medicine, pediatrics, neuro, psych, surgery. Um, and like that's how I kind of categorize them in my brain. So that's you know how we decided to do it today. And you know after each question, we will kind of break down some tips um, by, based on experience of how to prepare for these shelves um because lord knows it is not easy to prepare for them as you were like working a full-time job you know uh clinically um yeah well working without getting paid <laughs> oh gosh yeah, i know sore subject <laughs> yep um but and you know before before we get started again i cannot emphasize this enough if you guys you know, are in the preparation process for you know your shelves if, I know a lot of people by the time this um, releases will have just completed their first rotation of third year or maybe their second. Um, uh, we're kind of missing the boat for step two uh, in a way, but hopefully this episode will be a good resource for all. Can, where can people find um, your incredible courses, your organization, um, so that they can really excel on, on these uh, cornerstone exams? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, thanks for those kind words. So um, I can be found at High Guru Prep on Instagram. You can also follow me on Twitter. Um, my website, highguru.com, kind of has everything laid out. Um, more importantly, I just like to take a very personalized approach. So uh, I'll do my best to kind of... Uh, hear where you're at in your preparation. I have a step one course that's uh, been very popular, a YouTube channel as well. So this is kind of all encompassing uh, when it comes to which students uh, are best for the high guru uh, mentality, which focuses on active recall. So, uh, you know, I love to connect with whether you are allopathic, osteopathic, non-US IMG, US IMG. Um, I uh, really am so grateful to have uh, such a wonderful community thus far and again andy thanks for having me here today sure thing and all right so uh now this is probably the timestamp. uh was that 8 8 12 8 13 uh so those of you who didn't want to hear us ramble here we go let's get started with the questions all right, Andy. So before we get into the individual questions, I think it will be very helpful uh, for us to go through kind of how a USMLE question is written, uh, because this forms kind of the foundation for any of the uh, step one or shelf exam questions. So uh, I just want to sketch this out real quick, uh, just so that uh, everybody is familiar. So every single question is going to have uh, the first building block, which is the stem. And step one stems are like, what's the most likely mechanism? Whereas step two, it's like, what's the most likely diagnosis or the infamous, what's the next best step next. in management, yep. right? <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't mean to bring back PTSD, but just saying. <laughs> um, I'll be okay. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, so the, the first thing that uh, a USMLA question has is a chief complaint. And uh, the chief complaint is usually pretty short. And one of the things that I always like to say with the chief complaint is understand the tempo of the disease. So if it's like acute, you're gonna be thinking of things like trauma, infection, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. Then you have the elaboration of the chief complaint, which is called the HPI. That's followed by the past medical history, then the medications, and obviously like the meds and the past medical history kind of go hand in hand. For example, like mm -hmm. if the meds say the patient is on metformin, Chances are the past medical history is type two diabetes, uh, and you know they're they're very correlated. Uh, then you have like the allergies, 
immunizations, you have the social history, you have the family history, which if you notice any abnormalities in the family history, you may think that the patient's more predisposed, maybe genetically, to a certain condition. And then one thing that I always like to uh, pay attention to is after the family history, the actual vignette usually shifts into a different perspective. And I call this the physician's perspective. And that physician's perspective starts with the more objective data, vital signs, then physical exam, and then labs and imaging. And you'll notice that a lot of these questions, which we'll go through, follow this kind of building block approach. Yep. And for those watching, um, it's all on the screen. Those listening, this is very reminiscent of you, know, you going through your first year of med school, kind of breaking down the parts of an HPI and how to structure, you know, you got your old carts and then you go through all that. So you know, with the cool thing about step two, and I think why they are trying to put a ton more emphasis on it is that it is a lot more, not accurate, but I guess like the thought process is a lot similar, uh, a lot more similar to clinical practice. Um, so it reads like an oral presentation, really. Um, and so that that's how I think about uh, breaking down the questions. And so uh, with that, we can kind of put it into practice now with our first question. All right, let's go through this. So um, I usually just like to uh, start reading uh, the STEM. So we'll start with the STEM. Uh, which of the following findings may likely be present in this patient? So you have a three-day-old neonate who is in the nursery. And so whenever you're thinking about neonates, you think about acute things, maybe things that uh, occur during delivery, or you think about infection, uh, or maybe even things like birth trauma, etc. So he is acutely noted to be rigid and have eyes rolled back. Now, this is a pretty common illness script, right? When you're rigid and eyes rolled back, you're probably thinking about a seizure. And here we notice that the patient is limp on exam. So now, you know, my mind kind of is going through like, wow, this patient may have some issue with the central nervous system. And the central nervous system is composed of blood vessels, uh, cerebral spinal fluid, or like the ventricles, as well as the brain parenchyma. Maternal history is going to be unremarkable. So uh, this is a really good time for me to kind of like pause and say like unremarkable, no negative. These are what I call pertinent negatives. And what pertinent negatives are in a vignette, they essentially are areas where the test makers say, hey, don't worry about this. So for example, the maternal history is pretty benign. So it's not probably going to be something related to vertical transmission, let's say like an infection, STI type of thing. Mm -hmm. So baby was born full term with APGARs of eight and eight, at one and five minutes of life. So that's pretty good. And physical exam is notable for hypotonia, lethargy, long set face and low set ears. So as you can see, hypotonia lethargy, that kind of relates to the uh, chief complaint and HPI, but then the long set face and low set ears, that kind of brings up this possibility of maybe a genetic syndrome, right? Whenever you see mm -hmm. characteristic facies, your mind kind of shifts to that. And then you notice that the serum ionized calcium is going to be low in the labs. So that can be, you know, classified as hypocalcemia and can hypocalcemia cause CNS abnormalities? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so now when you're thinking about genetics and hypocalcemia, maybe in your mind, you're trying to kind of recall what content relates to hypocalcemia, seizures, genetic abnormality. And if you're thinking DeGeorge syndrome, you're absolutely correct. So, you know, after stabilization, a genetic panel is sent and the stem is which of the following findings may likely be present in this patient. So we have a 22Q11 deletion, B myotic non-disjunction, C, trinucleotide repeat disorder, or D, imprinting with paternal gene deletion. Andy, hate to put you on the spot. What do you think? I'm going to go with A, 22Q11 deletion. Absolutely. This is going to be uh, DeGeorge syndrome, which, uh, remember, just to integrate some step one, is uh, all related to the 
third and fourth pharyngeal pouch that doesn't form as correctly. So, oh, oh gosh, I know, I know, Jeez. I know. We all started twitching here. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, in all seriousness, it's, it's so important because, um, yeah. you know, this, this is actually under this um, uh, assessment category of multi-system disorders. And so mm -hmm. uh, this multi-system disorder, because you don't have parathyroids, you get hypocalcemia later on in life, this patient may have recurrent infections that are T cell uh, related because uh, they have thymic aplasia. And then if uh, this child got an echo, you may uh, be worried about a conotruncal defect like truncus arteriosus, tetralogy of Fallot, et cetera. Um, Andy, do you want to go through the uh, remaining uh, answer choices? Yeah. So have Myotic non-disjunction, child nucleotide repeat disorders, and then imprinting with uh, paternal gene deletion. And now I'm going to be trying to pull a ton of knowledge from the deep recess of my brain. Um, you know, I, at first, I, of course, I think the child nucleotide repeat disorder, how I, I typically go through it, is I start um, eliminating choices, too. So I knew for a fact the, the main ones are like, Trisomy 13, 18, and 21. Uh, for me, I saw like hypocalcemia. That's not a part of any of these. And there are a, a certain um, a pretty characteristic buzzwords with uh, 13 and 18. Um, oh, man. Thir 13 is, is that the one with the like overlapping fingers? Yeah, like Patel syndrome. Yeah. Yep, Patel, um, and eighteen. That's gonna be like the rocker bottom feet with Edwards yes. syndrome. Yep. That's right. Okay, um, and then basically any other trinucleotide repeat disorder is practically lethal. So the fact that this patient is still here and good APGAR scores and everything, I kind of eliminated trinucleotide uh, repeat disorder in my head. Yeah. No, I think um, I think that's a really good thought process. And, you know, just to kind of uh, loop that back in, remember, trinucleotide repeat disorders, some of them, I agree with you, they, they can be lethal. But things like, for example, myotonic dystrophy or fragile X syndrome or uh, Friedrich's ataxia yeah. or Huntington's disease, you know, we think about those trinucleotide repeat disorders uh, exhibiting a genetic principle called anticipation. Yep. Um, and, of course, the imprinting with a paternal gene – that is the, ooh, let's see. There's two of them. There's Ange, uh, Angelman's and um, Will, Williams. Uh, close, yeah, Prouder or, Willie. Or, yeah, Prouder Willie. Pr Prouder Willie. No, Williams yeah, 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 is, a, yeah. is a whole different thing. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So Prouder Willie, uh, I always remember it. This is the dumbest <laughs> acronym. I, it's like, uh, mom doesn't have a Willie uh, and dad. All right. Oh my god! <laughs> I cannot believe I'm saying this out loud. <laughs> and and so if I remember one one of them, I remember the, I remember the other. So there you go. It's not this, uh, guys. If, if you happen to remember that mom doesn't have a willy, that's how you remember uh, the mom is, uh, or the maternal gene uh, inheritance for that the 15 Q or something. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, chromosome fifteen, and you know the mom's genes are actually methylated, and it's the paternal genes that are mutated or deleted, and that's what gives you Prader Willi. And remember, these patients are going to have like hyperphagia, they're going to be obese, they're going to have intellectual disability, seizures, uh, et cetera. But yep. awesome, I I think this is a a great question breakdown. And one other point that I want to make, uh, especially as you guys go through like U World and NBMEs, is like every single answer choice if the question is written really nicely, has a assessment point that you should be thinking of or a diagnosis that you should be thinking of. So they're not here to trick you. They're here to see if you can discern between different diseases, for example. And so, yeah, and that's our, our pediatrics uh, question. Uh, I, I think pediatrics is pretty interesting because uh, at least for me, I got split into uh, your inpatient, your outpatient, and then, um, a subspecialty in two weeks of each uh, for my core rotation. And honestly, I, I did a lot of studying more on the outpatient um, and specialist end, just because inpatient I was on for 
12 days straight. I still remember that, like, you know, getting night handover at 6 a.m. And then being there, um, handling admissions, the longest rounds ever. Um, so I, my, my tip would be definitely try to get your um, studying in um, during those outpatient outpatient weeks. Um, incredible resources to use uh, the CHOP pathways, so Children's Hospital of um, Pennsylvania. Philadelphia. Uh, yep. Or, or Philadelphia. Yeah, Philadelphia. One of those. They both yeah, start yeah. with <laughs> But as one of the best children's hospitals in the world, they have great, great pathways. Um, if you search them, like asthma, uh, neonatal sepsis, all things that are super useful for you as a student to look up, uh, particularly when you're admitting some, uh, somebody inpatient. Um, but yeah, I think those are the big things. And of course, I always hammer home, practice questions, practice questions, practice questions, um, try to knock out you know, 20, 30 a day um, and really dive into them like how we are right now. Awesome. That's great. So, all right. If I, if I may put a plug just because pediatrics, I mean, we started with it. I'm a little biased. I'm in, I'm in the field, but um, you know, just a couple things like when you guys are clinically on your rotation, pediatrics and the history part always uh, ask about birth history and developmental milestones like that is really going to be uh, super helpful as you uh, interact with families and uh, pediatric patients. And then I, I completely agree with your study tactics. And sometimes what I found is rather than setting like question goals, even per day, I like to set question goals per week, just so that I know that if I'm on outpatient and I have a little extra time, I can do a little bit more questions and compared to inpatient. So at least that can uh, help keep you on pace to complete the UWorld questions uh, for the rotation. Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, and just en enjoy playing with the kids. I know, I, at least for me, I'm also biased. I enjoy the pediatric population. Uh, but some some people do not enjoy kids, but just, just know that they're cute. They are. <laughs> okay. Um, so we're... Actually, OBGYN. Okay, alrighty. So I, I can I can read this one and then All right, break it go down. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, we got a 34 year old female presents due to lower abdominal discomfort and new onset vaginal spotting for the past four days. The patient has a history of menorrhagia, uh, requiring an IUD placed two years prior, which decreased her frequency of menses. She has never been pregnant and has no history of STI. Um, BMI 31, vitals are stable. Uh, physical exam notes right at next fullness and tenderness. Cervix is closed. Urine pregnancy test is positive. Trans abdominal ultrasound shows small uterus with device in place. What is the next best step in management? And so our choices are A, diagnostic laparoscopy, B, transvaginal ultrasound, uh, C, uh, FSH and prolactin levels, D, endometrial biopsy, and E, IUD removal. Ah, the next, the, what is the next, next best step in management? Love it. Um, Rahul? All right. I'll, let's, go, let's go through this. So, um, you know, this 34-year-old comes in with pretty acute symptoms, right? Lower abdominal discomfort and new onset vaginal spotting. Uh, one thing for us to note here is that like lower abdominal discomfort, you can think of it like, is it GI or is it repro, right? Because uh, all of the lower quadrant things like appendicitis, diverticulitis, even suprapubic tenderness for cystitis are uh, going to be adjacent to organs such as the ovaries, uterus, et cetera, in this female. And once you see new onset vaginal spotting, which way does that kind of land you, GI or more repro? Repro. Exactly. So now she has a history of menorrhagia and she has this IUD placed, uh, which decreased her uh, frequency of uh, menses, which uh, essentially is a normal phenomena because uh, these are uh, hormone containing devices and they will shut down your hypothalamic pituitary axis, etc. Uh, never been pregnant, no history of STI. So here's our no negative and normal. What is that known as? Your pertinent negatives. Your pertinent negatives. So we're going to get away from things like uh, STI-mediated uh, PID, etc. And uh, BMI is going to be 31. So what's the uh, classification of that? So that I believe it's just obese. 
Yep. Um, so not not in the morbid category is uh, over twenty five is um, overweight, and then yep, uh, thirty exactly. above is obese. Yep, absolutely. And then you know, vital signs are stable, and I want to kind of like really make a point about this right here is because you know this is going to be a common theme that you all are going to see and shelf and step to ck exams especially related to next best step and management so like whenever vital signs are stable that is a good time for you to clue in and be like okay i can do a diagnostic test because like if vital signs are unstable what do you think the answer is going to be more related to andy surgery yeah, surgery, airway, breathing, circulation. You can't put unstable patients in a scanner, for example. Yep. So like whenever I see vital signs are stable, I say, all right, I can actually do a diagnostic test to confirm things and then move uh, stepwise. Now, physical exam shows that there is right adnexal fullness and tenderness. And this is super important because as you can see, it's unilateral. So because it's unilateral, you know, you're thinking about like an anatomic pathology, something that can only be on one side compared to like something bilateral, which could be hormonal mediated, et cetera, or systemically mediated. So this kind of brings up what specific working diagnosis. And in my mind, I think of a ectopic pregnancy, right? Where you mm -hmm. have right at nexal fullness. Now, obviously the patient has an IUD in place. And so that can prevent the intrauterine implantation of the uh, developing uh, embryo. And that's super important that, you know, IUDs can at times, if you get pregnant, um, be a risk factor for ectopic pregnancies. Cervix is closed. So you are not thinking about like any incomplete, inevitable abortions. Remember, those abortions are the ones that are going to be uh, with the cervix open. And then urine pregnancy test is positive, but with the right adnexal fullness and UPT being positive, what does that confirm our diagnosis of? Well, I wouldn't say confirm. Oh, yeah, that's good. I like so, it. I say it is most likely ectopic pregnancy route. Um, Absolutely. And it's funny you say kind of like working diagnosis because as I'm reading this, you know, there, there are things where, especially for OBGYN, they're trying to, you know, cue you in or lead you down a path or even to trick you. Um, so again, uh, the never been pregnant and no history of STIs, um, you know, a history of STI puts you, um, or even PID too, um, put you at risk for ectopic pregnancy. So no history is like, oh, okay, they're trying to cue you in on, eh, maybe, maybe it's not. And then BMI of 31, I'm thinking, you know, PCOS is on the differential as well, especially with like uh, unilateral um, adnexal tenderness. But as, as you go down, um, and again, it's like, oh man, do we need to take this person uh, to the OR immediately? Is this rupturing? Or could this be like an appy? Um, Vital signs are stable. Okay, that that already is like knocking things off my differential. And this is also like how, for me, I, I'm reading the question as well. It's like I have a ton of ideas in my head. As I'm reading, I'm like, okay, not less likely, less likely, less likely, more likely. Um, of course, the right adnex of fullness and tenderness. Now, like you mentioned, it's probably anatomical, um, but less likely infectious because the vital signs are stable. Services close, and now you know with the urine BCG or urine pregnancy test um, being positive, it's like all right, perfect. Now the leading is um, ectopic, and the reason why I said it, is it confirmed is because yeah, it's most likely, but there is one thing here that confirms the diagnosis. Absolutely, and you know you can see transabdominal ultrasound shows that. There's a small uterus with device in place. However, what you want to do is get just probably a better picture. And what's the answer then? Transvaginal ultrasound. And I will say, and you can you can uh, support me in this. US Emily loves ultrasound. If it's on, if it's one of the choices, always put that like like have a degree of suspicion that it's yeah. probably the ultrasound choice. Yeah, and I, I think ultrasound um, 
it has its advantages. You know, it's portable. Uh, it doesn't expose the patient to radiation. It's relatively quick. Uh, remember, ultrasound is going to be really good for, you know, uh, obstetrics, as well as like any sort of fluid collections uh, that you want to figure out whether it's going to be simple or complex. So I completely agree. Yep. Awesome. You're two for two, man. Thank you. And um, kind of briefly for the OBGYN rotation, um, I, I think I always recommend people do this one first, actually. I, that's how I arranged it, because you get a great experience of uh surgery so you you get to understand the flow of the or you get uh your outpatient so you learn how to run clinic you know how to write notes uh and then not just that but you get your inpatient so you get familiar with like pre-rounding um and rounds your presentations and everything so you get like this nice mixed bag where like sure you don't spend a ton of time in the OR, but you get you know, a little sampler platter of everything that you're probably going to get into uh, in third year. And I, I think if you do have a designated couple weeks on uh, l and I would recommend uh, to get a ton of studying done then because it's a lot of waiting around until this hits the fan. <laughs> and so like it can go from zero to 100 uh, real quick, but in those zero moments, you got nothing but time. So yeah, study exactly. during those moments. No, that's true. My wife is an OB uh, resident, so uh, she uh, also recommends, you know, when, when it is quiet, try to get uh, some studying uh, in. And I think that uh, whenever you're trying to, like, uh, balance your OBGYN studying, uh, think about, about it in, like, two separate kind of silos. You have the obstetrics and then you have the gynecology. And with the gynecology especially, I like to uh, think about it very anatomically. So I like to say, all right, let's start with vaginal pathologies, then go up to uh, you know your cervical, uterine, ovarian, et cetera. And then you can build like vignettes on that anatomic framework. Yeah. That's all right. Sweet. Oh man. Shall we go? I, I, I snuck in a radiograph and maybe you can like describe the radiograph as we go through and then, uh, yeah, we'll go through it. Your All thing. Right, oh, internal medicine. Here we go. So we have a 73 year old male smoker presenting with fatigue and arm pain. He has a history of back pain that has been refractory to acetaminophen. Vitals are stable. He has pallor and point tenderness in his left arm and ribs. His hematocrit is low. Serum calcium levels are elevated. Radiograph of the left arm is shown. And it is the left arm. Um, it's got like, <laughs> man, am I really going to use the buzzword? Moth-eaten uh, appearance to, to the bone. Kind of looks like Swiss cheese of the um, radius and ulna there. Um, and no, no obvious... Uh, deformities or um like displacement no fractures anything like that sorry a little bit of the ortho bro came out in me um so which, which of the following diagnostics would be the most useful next best step in management so we got a blood culture b bone marrow biopsy uh c bone scan d serum uh pthrp Parathyroid-related uh, peptide. Yeah. Um, and it's funny, like, my brain doesn't translate that. It's just like, <laughs> PTRP, I know, and it's, it's like, I know what it is, and I in my head it translated, but... <laughs> no, that that's my bad, because I was just too lazy to type, type the whole thing out, so Good. my bad. Um, and then E, serum protein electrophoresis. So, Rahul, what should we be thinking about here? Awesome. Uh, I think you did a, a uh, excellent categorization, and you know one one of the big picture points as this uh, question has like an image is you really use like the vignette to help confirm what you were thinking uh, and going for with the image, and I think that's like such an important point is that like shelf. Uh, step two, even step one questions, like they're not expecting you to be radiologists or pathologists. So if you can really like double down and be like, okay, I need to like figure out what's going on in the vignette and 
I'm going to confirm my suspicion with the pathology slide or with the uh, radiograph. I think that that's going to be really um, helpful and important. Um, one of the points that I just want to bring up is, you know, here you have a 73-year-old male smoker and has fatigue and arm pain, right? And fatigue is something like constitutional. And then he has a history of back pain that's refractory to acetaminophen. Like when I hear of the word refractory, and sometimes what they'll say is uh, the patient continues to have back pain despite acetaminophen. So this is like super important because like when you hear about refractory, Clinically and from an exam standpoint, what that means is that maybe you just didn't give enough acetaminophen, or maybe you have to bump up to the second line therapy, like morphine or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe you're just like missing something. Like this is not musculoskeletal back pain because what, what is the diagnosis, Andy? This is, I believe, MM. Yeah, multiple, multiple myeloma. myeloma. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Exactly. And like, you know, the hematocrit being low, I was kind of wanting to incorporate the rouleau formation uh, because, you know, the immunoglobulins uh, that the plasma cell discretion multiple myeloma makes is going to just stick kind of like uh, a sugar coated Twizzler uh, stick to the red blood cells and cause them to stack up like poker chips. Uh, you have the osteolytic lesions and the osteolytic lesions also uh, contribute to the elevations in calcium. These patients can have renal dysfunction. These patients can also have really bad infections because yeah, they're making a ish ton of uh, immunoglobulins. But remember, these immunoglobulins are not like effective at all. And yeah, exactly. They're not yep. working. So, uh, all right, cool. How would you uh, work up this patient? Next best step. So I would go with the serum protein electrophoresis. Yeah, absolutely. So serum protein electrophoresis, you'll see that M spike. And remember, the M spike actually represents like IgG or IgA that's elevated. And sometimes like in my mind, when I was going through med school, I was like M spike, IgM. And it's like, nope, nope, nope. IgM, M spike, you're probably thinking about something like Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, which has hyperviscosity syndrome uh, symptoms and IgM, whereas this one is an M protein, which means a monoclonal spike of IgG. Yep. Um, and I believe there's a nice little uh, acne crab, right? Yeah. For multiple myeloma, uh, you got the hypercalcemia for a C. Uh, renal dysfunction for the R, anemia for the A. Oh, gosh. What's the B? I, I think back pain or bone oh, issues. Oh, it is back yeah, or bone back, issues. Back, back slash bone pain. That's what it yeah. is. Yep. Yeah. Um, so uh, if you look back in the question, Sam, uh, you you now four for four <laughs> there. So exactly, exactly, and and you don't know, like one thing that I will say just as a really nice illness script for I am shelf. If you see an elderly patient with back pain, the two differentials that I would encourage you to think about is prostate cancer that metastasized to the vertebrae or multiple myeloma. Like that ends up kind of at least being uh, two of the most common uh, illness scripts that they like to test. Or osteoblastoma. Yeah, could be osteoblastoma. Too. So could, could even be, uh, you know, Paget's disease of the bone. Who knows? Yeah. yeah. Osteoblastoma is the classic. Uh, like back pain, refractory to NSAIDs or yeah. acetaminophen. Yeah. It hurts at night. Um, yeah. So extra learning for you. And again, for internal medicine, this was honestly the toughest one to study for um, shelf-wise just because there's so much. And with and my rotation is only six weeks. God, it was not enough time to prepare, um, yeah. to be honest. And, oh. and it's a majority of step two CK uh, as well. It's like 50 to 60% of step two CK, which is crazy. Yeah. So, I, I mean, a part of me wants to recommend uh, doing internal medicine later in the year, just because like you pick up a bunch of other tools from your other rotations. I did it second and that was rough. And uh, the thing that saved me was we do like shelf retakes where you can t take it again um, to get a higher score. So like the first time didn't go well, uh, and the second one managed to go pretty well because I took it at the end of my entire clerkship year. Um, so I, I will say the biggest tip for studying uh, <laughs> internal medicine is give yourself some grace. There are going to be days where you were just too tired to do your questions, and you're going to feel like the world is ending. Yeah. It's not. 
it's okay. If you need the rest day, please take it because I am is a brutal rotation. Yeah, for sure. No, I, I resonate with that. And like, uh, balance is so key. Uh, don't lose yourself during these tough rotations. Like I am where you're there probably until sign out sometimes. And that's where like questions per week again, uh, is very helpful because maybe you have a Saturday off and you know, you need to get 120 of those questions, uh, in, in the week. Okay. I can maybe do a little bit more when I'm fresh, uh, at a, a coffee shop, uh, at, which is my choice, uh, or the place that I like to study. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can do that. You can do more questions on the weekend then and uh yeah no that's great very nice so moving right around along to neurology so we got a 52 year old woman presenting with sudden left-sided weakness and speech difficulty noticed seven hours ago highlight seven hours ago uh she has a history of smoking hypertension diabetes and fainting episodes uh family history of stroke in the first degree uh, examination reveals left uh, side of facial droop uh, and reduced strength on the left side brain mri indicates an ischemic stroke in the right mca or middle cerebral artery distribution which of the following patient risk factors is the strongest modifiable risk factor given this presentation oh this is a high yield one okay uh so a smoking b Diabetes, uh, diabetes mellitus, C, hypertension, or D, family history. And this is one of those things that, oh, I, I'm not going to lie, I, I watched, also shout out to uh, Dr. High Yield, um, Dr. Stephen Vu, uh, he is also a fan of the channel, but I still remember watching his um, neurology review and was like, this is just one of those things where you just, just know it and reflexively no and it is that well actually do you want to explain it a little bit before i just regurgitate no go for it i i like it you're you're on a track so i don't want to yeah, so take you away stroke no matter what the biggest risk factor is hypertension for strokes like and, and they'll try to trip you up with the history of smoking diabetes and everything but just stroke, biggest risk factor, hypertension. Boom. Mic drop. Yep. All right. Awesome. No, I, I, I completely agree. And, uh, you know, I, I love Dr. High Yield's uh, videos. They're, they're so great. Um, so, you know, this question um, is a very common question question stem that you'll get, right? And it's like the risk factor question. And when I was going through this, I was like, all of these are bad. Like, I don't want, I don't want to have my patients have any of these uncontrolled, like uncontrolled smoking. No. Uh, but you know, the USMLE and shelf really want you to know, like, what is the strongest risk factor? Because if you think about it to integrate step one, that strongest risk factor kind of dominoes the cascade of events to get you to that pathology. Right? So it's like in the pathophysiologic mechanism, the first step may be these risk factors. And so um, the takeaway in this question in my mind is basically like, if you have a patient who has focal neurological deficits, it is stroke until proven otherwise. And this is clinically as well. Like whenever I see a child who comes in with focal neurological deficits, I'm gonna definitely rule out stroke before I say, oh yeah, it's just like migraine with stroke-like features. It's like, no, I have to do my due diligence. And so um, you're absolutely correct when you're saying hypertension, modifiable risk factor uh, for stroke. Remember family history. I wish you can modify your family, but uh, it's a, a age is one of uh, the non-modifiable -mod uh, risk factors. So mm -hmm. just something to keep in mind. And also age will probably pop up as an answer choice too. Yeah. Same thing, same thing. Smoking is here too. You're going to be like, oh yeah, you can quit smoking. Like that's going to be the biggest modifiable one. You know, it's super well correlated with hypercoagulability. Just block it all out and reflexively um, say hypertension. Um, I will say uh, you said it looks like brain, you include a brain MRI, uh, just a learning pro for everybody. Uh, you will have a question where somebody's coming in for a stroke and it will be a uh, next best step in management. Knee jerk, non-con head CT. Because you are trying to rule out uh, hemorrhagic 
stroke versus Absolutely. ischemic. Um, so that you are guaranteed to get a question on that on your neuro, neuro shelf. Uh, and uh, of course, with with this, my neurology rotation was only three weeks, so I really had to cram um, to yeah. get this thing done. Uh, I would say be pretty. I did. I did it was like inpatient in the morning, outpatient um, in the afternoon. Yeah. Um, really hammer home your um, your distributions of like kind of kind of your what is it called homunculus homunculus. Um, so localizing say if this like the mca goes out like what's going to be uh affected is super super crucial you get so many questions on um that sort of localization rule of fours for um brain stem uh localization i i literally just like i don't know any of those paths but i just like remember the rule of fours and i can figure it out um so th- those are my two biggest biggest tips um really hammer home stroke yeah, for sure. I I love I love those pearls and uh, yeah, non contrast head CT especially uh, to stratify hemorrhagic versus ischemic and your decision making for TPA uh, as well if the patient has uh, symptoms uh, and they present within four and a half hours. So, oh Ooh. man, you stole my thunder. I was gonna say like, oh no. Hey, does anybody know what the time frame for TPA is? Uh, I'll leave in the comments, but you gave it away. <laughs> my bad. It's okay. All right. We'll well, get, we'll get a question here. How about that? We, we got our last question, surgery, uh, for the surgery shelf. Got a 40-year-old female um, brought to the emergency department due to unilateral lower abdominal pain. There is a broad differential for that. Uh, the patient has a history of refractory uh, inflammatory bowel disease, hypertension, glucocorticoid-induced hyperglycemia, uh, abdominal examination, uh, is significant for centripetal obesity and abdominal stri- is it stri? 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 Yeah. Potato, yeah. potato. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the patient is found to have an incarcerated hernia and is taken emergently for a laparotomy. The surgical procedure is uncomplicated. However, in the post-recovery room, she becomes acutely hypotensive and tachycardic despite normal saline IV fluid bolses. No bleeding is noted at the site and abdominal exam is unchanged. Which of the following is the best immediate step in management of this patient? A, CT scan of abdomen. B, epinephrine infusion. C, subcutaneous epinephrine. Or D, hydrocortisone. Oh, I love this question. I love this because you are guaranteed to get one of these on either surgery or even internal medicine yeah or even step um, one honestly yeah that that too um so th- this is something that i i see in the uh pack you a lot I, well not not a lot but it's one of those things that they always ask me about um in recovery so there, there's a couple things here that are super significant one history um two vital so you know Going back to our first question, vital signs stable is a big key. Here, vital signs are not stable. Um, it's hypotensive with um, compensatory tachycardia. So this is where history is super important and also uh, understanding um, the treatment for uh, a lot of past medical history. So notice we have refractory, t- refractory inflammatory bowel disease, hypertension, and glucocorticoid-induced hyperglycemia. And so for um, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, you, a lot of the treatment consists of chronic steroid use. And not just that, but I mean, you, you kind of made it easy, but you're, you have glucocorticoid-induced hyperglycemia. You gotta have a lot of glucocorticoids in your system uh, chronically to have that going on and then not just that, but now you throw in the obesity, abdominal stray in there too. So this person is used to ha- being loaded with glucocorticoids. Now, what does that do to the endocrine system, Dr. Demania? 
All right. So no, I, I love your thought process. And, and uh, essentially what you're describing is that this patient is going to have Cushing syndrome secondary to chronic steroid use, right? And whenever you have chronic steroids, just to integrate some step one stuff, it is uh, going to cause you to have suppression of the hypothalamic pituitary axis, uh, specifically the adrenal axis. So you're going to have low ACTH, you're going to have low endogenous cortisol, um, et cetera. And so in these patients, what's super important for us to do is consider something like surgery a stressor. So if it's a stressor and they don't have the endogenous cortisol, Andy, what's going to be the most immediate next best step that you may even need to give prior to or intra OR? Oh, you need to kind of supplement uh, that steroid. So hydrocortisone, because um, like you said, the ACTH and everything, it's all messed up. And those are things that regulate blood pressure. Yeah. Um, so you know, with them not being able to respond appropriately on their own, they need some exogenous <laughs> steroids. So uh, yeah, I've, I've seen this uh, given a lot in PACU. So hydrocortisone, D. Yeah, absolutely. Great, uh, great answer. It's the correct answer. Remember that uh, just to uh, highlight uh, again, that Whenever a patient is unstable, you don't want to put them in a scanner. Um, I always like to give a little bit of tough love, but I think it's super important. But I always tell my pediatric ICU fellows that unstable patients do not get transported out of the ICU. And why is that? Because you don't want to die in a CT scanner and you don't want to die in the hospital elevator going down to the CT scanner. And so yeah. it's really important to stay prepared for any emergencies. But if the patient is unstable in front of you, you have to uh, resuscitate them and uh, make sure that they are vitally stable before moving them anywhere. Um, epi infusion would be probably the correct answer if you're worried about some sort of cardiogenic shock. And sub Q epi uh, or IM epi, for example, would be if uh, the patient um, you thought had anaphylaxis, which is uh, not necessarily going to be uh, the case here. Um, so excellent job. And one one other thing for surgery uh, shelf and surgery questions that I would also emphasize is always think about post-operative complications. Uh, this is uh, one of the complications where you could have an adrenal crisis, but there could be things like bleeding, infection, et cetera, on a certain timeline for your surgery questions. Yep. Um, and especially for surgery, I, I notice again, you can um, confirm or deny this. A lot of USMLE questions are testing the branch point between do nothing and do everything. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll get a ton of these questions uh, in you know, with a patient presenting in the emergency department where you know you have to piece out. It's either stabilize in the ER, discharge like with outpatient follow up, or uh, get them back to the OR right now and so um learning that branch point I, I think is a skill but something that will really really help you on your surgery um shelf uh and honestly on your surgery rotation um because you know you will be called down um for consults uh, in the emergency department you will be called to assess them and you need to make that determination of like do i need to call my attending to get this rolled back like in the next hour or especially if you're on overnight call like do i need to wake my attending up for this <laughs> you know like is he going to be pissed off that he's coming in for a non-emergent case at 3 a.m in the morning or is this oh god this has to go back now um absolutely so uh, you know both practically and um within your shelves it's yeah. super useful to know that branch point. For sure. And, you know, I, I just, you bring a really nice uh, uh, distinction up. Uh, and sometimes what you'll hear on your um, actual rotations is, oh, there's the board answer, and then there's what we do clinically. And, you know, for me, I actually uh, refute that argument. And to be honest, I'll tell you why. And that is because board questions are going to test you very objectively in a very black and white scenario, whereas, like, clinically – the truth is always in the middle, and there are so many other complex patient system uh, type of considerations which you have to uh, take into account. And so 
sometimes uh, when you are, you know, maybe a little bit frustrated at some of the answers based on what you're seeing in uh, clinical uh, rotations, uh, just take a step back and just try to make sure uh, that you center yourself around the fact that boards are testing a very objective uh, situation and you want to go with more of that textbook answer. And that textbook answer also helps clinically as well. Yeah. Um, and, and that's that also is a learned skill too. Uh, I remember you know, expressing my frustration a lot, even to you, um, during during my uh, clerkships. Cause it's just like, man, I I wasn't doing well on practice tests and everything. Cause I would see my attending do one thing, and then that answer choice would of course be there. And you know, it's <laughs> I pick it, I get it wrong, and I'm like, what do you mean? I saw this done. It's like, does this mean that I'm witnessing malpractice daily? It's like, no. There's a there's an art to it. Um. But yeah, I, I think for me, I enjoy kind of a test taking strategy and knowing that there there is uh, maybe this isn't a great word for it, but a game to to the uh, test, and that's how I've always approached standardized testing. Yeah. Um, and and I I really enjoy doing this stuff because it it allows you you guys those watching and listening to see how like. My brain works, your brain works as we're reading through these questions. Uh, and hopefully you can take some of those and um, you know put it in your own study uh, and test taking stu- toolbox. Um, yeah. And uh, Rahul, I, I would honestly love to um, do events and live streams and even do more of uh, these uh, in the future. Again, if you watching and listening, please let me know in the comments if you uh, enjoy this kind of content. And I, you know, as a fourth year, as I'm looking forward to graduating, I, I feel a little bit more confident um, addressing these questions. You know, I, I have a fairly complete uh, clinical fun. <laughs> now, uh, I was a little nervous uh, with the, the George coming out. I was like, oh man, this is pulling some deep genetics from the back of my head um, but i managed to you did awesome managed yeah. to did, do okay today <laughs> yeah no andy i i completely agree and uh thanks for having me uh on and uh honestly you're so talented great job with these questions and all the stuff you're doing too thank you so much and um if you guys are in the preparation stages for <clears throat> your shelves or uh usmle Please go check out Haguru. He's going to have courses, and uh, I believe by the time uh, this goes up, uh, or if not uh, very shortly after, there will be a brand new, beautiful step two course uh, ready um, to check out. Uh, And if anything, uh, I swear up and down by the Notion template. Uh, Thank you. If you if you guys don't pick up anything else from um, Haguru's plethora of resources. Notion template. I, I'm telling you, it organized my life and it ran my life for for three months. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I, I don't think I would have survived without it. Um, it helped me to schedule what I need to get done every single day. Um, it took a lot of the backbone work out of like listing what um, videos of sketchy chapters of first day, um, chapters of pathoma that I need to get through uh, each day, and like it just. It's so much back end work that is saved, um, and I cannot recommend it enough. Um, and if you guys are in the market for a pass fail course, because you know everybody's trying to bullet through and just get step one out of the way at this point, uh, I would also highly recommend um, his course too. I, I used it to knock out step one in like three and a half weeks or something like that. Yeah. No, thanks so much. I, I, I really like taking a lot of this uh, information for step one, especially, and, uh, you know, step two as I work on that content and, and really just uh, integrate and collate it and make it, you know, high energy and fun. Um, I think we, as uh, developing medical students and physicians, we are all in this whole business of lifelong learning. And if I can make these high stakes exams just a little less stressful, I think that that's my overall mission when it comes to uh, uh, doing all this USMLE stuff and being an uber nerd. <laughs> and you, I mean, you do a great job at, oh, at mentoring students. Again, cannot thank you enough uh, for your help over third year. Uh, 
Earl, thank you so much for your time and your knowledge, expertise. Um, again, everybody, uh, check out his stuff. Let me know down in the comments if you would like to see more of you know, this kind of content. And I would love to uh, do some sort of live stream event um, where we can do this again in, in a more, uh, I guess, long form longer form uh content and even had the ability to be interactive uh with you guys yeah. so for sure um, always fun hanging out absolutely thanks for watching thanks for listening and we will see you in the next one bye